Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for coming. I'm pleased to introduce the 2023 Marjorie Mead Hooker Visiting Scholar, Deborah Burke. Um, this prestigious visiting position was established at UNM School of Architecture and Planning to honor the memory of Marjorie Mead Hooker. A, a pioneer in the profession of architecture, Marjorie Mead Hooker was the first woman to earn a Bachelor of Architecture degree from the University of Texas and the third woman to earn licensure uh, and to practice architecture in Texas. The first woman to be elected the president of AIA Albuquerque and the first woman to serve on the New Mexico Board of Examiners of Architects. From 1951 to 1988, she practiced in several offices, including her own practice. In 1990, she received the Governor's Award for Outstanding New Mexico Women. In 2003, she received the New Mexico Architects Medal from AIA New Mexico. Deborah Burke, F. AIA Lead AP, is an architect, educator, and dean of the Yale School of Architecture. She has been a professor at Yale since 1988. In 2012, she was the inaugural recipient of, recipient of the Berkeley Rupp Prize at the University of of California Berkeley, which is given to an architect who has advanced in the position of women in the profession and whose work emphasizes a commitment to sustainability in the community. In 22, she received the AIA ACSA uh, Topaz Medallion, the highest honor in architectural education that reflects the recipient's commitment to service to, to the profession, academy, and society. She's the founder of the New York-based architecture firm, Deborah Burke Partners, and Deborah is a graduate of RISD, and the City College of New York. In 2005, she was awarded an honorary doctorate of fine arts from the Rhode Island School of Design. In 2017, her firm received the National Design Award from the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum. In 22, she was inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Letters. Um, I also have the great pleasure of calling Deborah a friend. Uh, she hired me at, to teach at Yale um, and uh, was really a significant thing for me. I like to add my own sort of thing to the bio, not just reading off it, but um, um, has been a great friend and mentor ever since. And um, join me in welcoming Deborah Burke. So thank you. Wow. Woo. Okay, thank you, Chris. And Robert, I see you in the back. Thank you to my friends. I have a couple of friends here, a Yale graduate I know family, which is really nice. Other people I know, yay. Um, that's really nice. Thank you uh, all for coming. And I have to say, I have completely, like I have a deep crush now on New Mexico. I haven't been here that much, but I've fallen madly in love. So you guys are gonna have to <laughs> keep welcoming me. Um, uh, did it go? It did go, good. Um, no, it didn't. Let's see. Oh, there. Got it. Okay. So here's the deal. When I spoke to Chris about what he wanted me to talk about, um, he said, make it a bit of a working architect's autobiography so that students understand the trajectory of a career and not just think that somebody who stands up here sort of springs full blown into the world like this, because we don't. Uh, so I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my life and then my work as an architect. Um, happy building to you all, that's what we do. Um, so I'm from Queens, uh, which is a borough of New York City, perhaps best known for being the most diverse county in the United States. Two and a quarter million people live there. They come from hundreds of different countries and speak over 800 different languages and dialects. And I went to New York City Public Schools, and this is the autobiography part. And then I went to an all girls boarding school in Massachusetts as a scholarship kid. And I then went to RISD as uh, Chris said, which is an art school, but I studied architecture there. And when I got out of school, there was a really, really severe recession. There was no work for architects. So I got a job as a graphic designer in a global engineering firm. This is my work from that period. And it essentially describes how we, in that period, stored oil underground in the salt domes of Louisiana. And I can tell you that that job was not for me. So I left and got a job in a program, a brilliant program that used to be offered by the National Endowment for the Arts. And it's really a shame that it doesn't exist anymore because it put artists, architects, dancers, poets, composers, painters, you name it, in public elementary schools all across the country to teach students who weren't being reached by traditional uh, curriculum. 
this is like a month or so um, And that got me into teaching. And then along with a friend, I founded a program for high school students at the Institute for Architecture and Urban Studies. That's a Peter Eisenman's think tank in New York. And then I went back to school to get a master's degree in urban planning because I was really frustrated by all of the limitations that building buildings in cities placed on architects. And following that, I got a visiting teaching gig at the University of Miami. And through that, spent many summers in the Florida Panhandle building houses at Seaside, uh, which is the first built example of the new urbanism, which is actually uh, a design approach that I have a very complex, uh, fraught relationship with. And when the Dean of Miami became the Dean at the University of Maryland, he recruited me. I started a little practice in Washington, DC and mostly did projects elsewhere, um, and then got recruited to apply for a position at Yale, and I moved my practice back to New York to be closer to my family. And at that point in my life, I did almost any project that came my way. I, I didn't have two nickels to rub together. So in the early 1990s, we converted a 1930s auto repair garage on Manhattan's Lower West Side into photographic studios for the fashion industry. It was a kind of honest workaday building, about 20,000 square feet with a column grid on the ground floor and a 90 foot clear span on the second floor. And you could drive up to the second floor because of course they fixed cars there. And the client like us really loved the rough industrial quality of this building. Um, so what we did there was highlight its attributes, uh, cleaned up the parts uh, that had some potential and sort of pointed out. And most importantly, I would say, we stripped the cladding off the trusses and added clear story windows behind them to show up their kind of rough functional beauty and bring a lot more daylight uh, into the building. I'm having a hard time getting this thing to advance. Back up? No, it did not. I apologize. Right. Well, it's not happy. Mm -hmm. Oh, there we go. Can, yes, you on that side. Okay. I know I do want to see. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. So, also around this time in the 1990s, which is now obviously a really long time ago. Uh, I wrote a book with a colleague called The Architecture of the Everyday, and it was very radical for its time because it celebrated more the rough and ready or the uh, rough and tumble maybe, and it argued for an architecture that wasn't about monuments by architects, uh, but for buildings that were part of the everyday fabric and served their community. Um, and then in 2020, now I'm going to really speed this autobiography along, uh, which was the summer that COVID descended on us across the country, the summer that George Floyd was murdered. I went back and looked at that book and read the essay that I wrote in it and realized that parts of it were okay, but there were a lot of things that I left out. And so, and, you know, that was a tough period for everybody. Uh, and I asked myself if I were writing this book again in this essay again, what would I say? So the essay was kind of a manifesto and um, I open it by saying in this climate, the architect must become a celebrity in order to gain the opportunity to build. So I was criticizing architecture. But what I was really saying was that architects don't have to look like this and do buildings like this and certainly not do buildings like this, God forbid, or build cities that look like this, right? This is all wrong. And I also said this, um, and the fact that architecture has made so little progress in this direction since the 90s is kind of a disgrace um, and perhaps contributes in some ways to many of the difficult conditions we find ourselves experiencing today, not only as architects, but actually as people. So that was a cool thing to say and pretty advanced for its time, I guess. But honestly, uh, my essay uh, also missed a lot of important things. And if I were writing it today, as I said, I would maybe talk about the environment a little bit more and address architecture's role in the climate crisis. 
because we are on our way to a complete disaster and buildings play an enormous part in humanity's carbon footprint and output. And we've helped make a world that looks like this. I mean, you don't see it here where the skies are so big and so blue, but it looks pretty bad in a lot of places. And uh, where is any mention of the city? I didn't mention that really enough in my essay either. And I think at the urban scale, uh, we have to ask about the just distribution of resources, the freedom of the city that's part of urban citizenship, and how we distribute uh, equity across the city in a reasonable way, which is certainly something we don't do now. And also understand that cities are places not only to learn and create and raise a family and do your work, but they're also places where we are allowed to, in this country, raise our collective voice, and we can't let that right go. But there's another giant question, which is what about our profession itself? Because in, in addition to the environment and urbanism, I didn't talk with enough criticism about us as architects. Um, so I would still say, let's acknowledge the needs of the many, but I'd also note that the place to start would be for us being self-critical so that career paths don't look like this and that the profession doesn't look like this. Like it doesn't begin to reflect the diversity of our society or the talents of the many intricate and overlapping cultures uh, that are here in this country and beyond. And not just in offices and not just in being architects, but out in the field and all the related professions and trades. But beyond the profession, the larger societal issue, particularly in the United States, but also around the world, is one of social justice, which I didn't talk about at all in 1990s. When I was in graduate school studying urban planning, uh, we were taught that zoning was a good thing. It kind of prevented the meatpacking plant from being next door to the nursery school. And we were taught that there were bad things like exclusionary zoning, but nowhere near in enough depth would we talk about uh, racial discrimination within zoning codes and mortgage legislation and infrastructure inequalities, which are really no different than zoning inequalities. Uh, I think we need to take them on as a broad part of our domain, we design stuff. So for instance, there is a condition called plumbing poverty. It's across this country and around the world. And it's about access to potable water and access to any water at all. Uh, plumbing poverty describes communities without potable water and those without indoor plumbing. And they overlap with relative consistency with areas of poverty and on the lands of indigenous populations. This is a terrifying map. And perhaps this is what Chris wanted me to talk about because uh, where I was 25 or 30 years ago is actually not that different from where I am today, which is that the buildings that we design in my office are based on an ethic, which is the idea that the truest measure of good design is the good it does in the world, imaginatively, sustainably, and delightfully. But let's be honest, we're architects, and we also kind of like to do this work because we're ambitious. This is a diagram of the architect's brain, right? Notice the big centerpiece. Um, buildings last a long time. A lot of people see them. It's really hard work to design a building. It's even hard work to actually design a bad building. So, um, and you really, after all that work, sort of want to strut your stuff. So what's the right balance to working with an ethic? So I'm going to show you a few projects. Um, we can talk after. Uh, the first is a building for the engineering firm Cummins. This is in Indianapolis in the downtown. The circle is sort of the center of downtown. It's their war memorial. And we're just two blocks down from that where you see the shaded footprint. Um, you can see the building from the wall, War Memorial. It looks like this, but it gets more interesting as you turn around to the south side um, where it opens up. And one of the things we convinced Cummings to do is they could have fit their whole project in a one-story building and taken up the whole block. But we said, if you make it tall, you can give the city a park. 
Uh, there's also a six-story mural inside the building designed by a Nigerian-American painter called Odili Donald Obata. Um, and the idea was that the fenestration pattern allows that work of art uh, to be an experience for those who are outside. But the tall building and the narrow foot plate, floor plate of it allowed it to be completely daylit. Um, and so that was a good thing. Nobody had to turn on their lights, but it also required that we put all kinds of passive shading elements on it, horizontal and vertical, depending on the location and some opaque panels for moments of privacy and solid walls. Um, I'm sorry, I get a riff going and then I can't advance the slides. Anyway, engineers work in this building and they really liked all this scientific uh, collaboration of how the facade actually worked. Um, but for us, in addition to that facade, the outdoor space was the really significant part of our design. And we worked with David Rubin, um, the landscape architect from Philadelphia. It works year round as a place of movement, even if you don't wanna be outside. But in the spring, summer and fall, it's really lush, you can hear the birds. Um, and it becomes an extension of the office and an extension of the city, almost like a living room for intimate events, as well as for a place for people to gather. And I think when we build in cities, uh, we have a responsibility to those cities. The buildings have a responsibility to the city as well. Now, do we also do beautiful homes for rich people? Yep, we do. It's fun. They pay us a lot of money and that subsidizes all the other stuff we do. I'm being really candid. Um, it's, it's fun and satisfying in a slightly different way than the rest of the work I'm gonna show you tonight. Uh, but this is a tiny little house in Connecticut. Um, and as I said, the fees that we get on projects like this help support the pro bono work we take on in the office. Um, and we do insist that those projects are not McMansions, but are actually small and elegant and very, very connected uh, to the land. But at the other scale, we also do a lot of work on college campuses. And recently, Princeton University decided to enlarge its undergraduate population. And we were hired to do two new residential colleges that would add a thousand students to Princeton. So I don't think that's probably much here on the UNM campus, but for Princeton that increased the size of their undergraduate student body by 25%, which was an enormous increase. Um, and residential colleges are kind of like dorms plus. They have eating halls, little theaters, ceramic shops, you know, niceties and shared working spaces and the like. Um, and our site was to the south of the existing historic Princeton campus. And it also sloped more than 20 feet as it headed further south. So that allowed for the lower levels uh, to also be able to open directly to the outside and we can make courtyards like the one that you see here sort of between the two residential colleges. Um, so the buildings completely broke from Princeton's Gothic traditions, but they main maintained the same color palette and that was the way we sort of spoke across the campus. Um, and they're arranged in a series of interlocked open-sided courtyards that you can see through from one to the next. And they celebrate a visibility um, that's in really in intentional direct contrast to the closedness of the Gothic buildings, which had solid stone walls that came all the way down to the ground. So they were very exclusive in a bad way because you had no idea, I'm not sure there's exclusive in a good way, but uh, you had no idea what was going on inside. Whereas here we celebrated movement and visibility and connection to the outdoors at every possible opportunity. Now you're looking into that lower courtyard from part of the dining hall. Um, and there are ample spaces uh, to work. None of them are prescriptive. Um, you can see your friends and decide if you wanna join them or not. Maybe you even see somebody you don't quite like, so you can find another way to go in and get to the elevator. Um, you can move the furniture around. That was very, very intentional. And once you get to your floor, there are also smaller areas for gathering, lots of color, uh, and for socializing and for studying. And we even made some outdoor spaces that would serve the same way, a kind of soapbox where you could read, do poetry slams, do performance, skateboard, 
uh, against this has become an Instagram favorite, as you might imagine, because it's such a shiny yellow background. Um, and the intention of Princeton was to expand to include students who would not have gone there in the past or even think that they could go there in the past. And we wanted to make sure that they felt welcome through the language of architecture. And the goal was really to say through building, there's a place for you here. Now, unfortunately, not all of our projects get built, even ones with sort of emphatic good intentions. This project is called, called the Women's Building. I'll tell you a little story about it. Building sits on the west side of Manhattan in Chelsea. It was designed in the 1930s by the architects of the Empire State Building, Shreve Lamb and Harmon. And it was built essentially called the Siemens Building as a YMCA for sailors coming into New York Harbor. It was actually a beautiful piece of architecture. If you squint, you can see that these are the front of ships uh, put in polychrome terracotta, um, some in great condition. And some of the building like those window frames tell you a not so happy story that, that happened later in the building's life. So this was a community center for young men and the old photos are fabulous, right? Get your mail, get a haircut, go for a swim, do some job training. And it had these weensy little, private rooms. They were six and a half feet wide and 10 feet long. And uh, because you only slept here and the rest of the time you were meant to be out in the social spaces or enjoying the city. So these repetitive small rooms were the beginning of kind of the building's bad story because in 1974, it was shut, the New York Harbor had decreased its activity and it was turned into a prison for women. Uh, called the Bayview Correctional Facility. It operated in Manhattan without really anybody noticing for more than 40 years. And in 2012, when Hurricane Sandy hit, it flooded the building up to the top of the second, win second floor windows and the women were moved out. And a year later, given the severity of the damage, uh, the prison was decommissioned. Now, the period of it as a woman's prison was one of real darkness. It, was, it had the highest rate of sexual assault within the New York State prison system. So it was pretty profound in 2015 when the state granted the Novo Foundation, which is a social justice organization, the opportunity to reimagine the building. And they had the idea of transforming it into what they called the women's building. And we won an international design competition to design this new home essentially for lots of different NGOs, foundations, working groups, all connected with women's and girls' rights around the world uh, to share a building so they could share space and concentrate on the work that they needed to do. So it was gonna be community center, uh, learning center, history of female activism, space for conferences, meetings, events, childcare, medical services, and, and food, of course. Um, and we spent more than a year listening to the community uh, to hear what they wanted. I would almost call it radically slow, which the foundation supported. And I think, we, and we made discoveries we wouldn't have discovered otherwise. We heard from the neighborhood, we heard from the broad community, and we spoke with leaders of women's and girls' rights-related nonprofits. And we spoke with the women who had been incarcerated in Bayview and elsewhere. And what was so interesting about their story was that they wanted the new place to be a place of optimism. And this is some of the drawings they did. You can actually see the front door to the building on that angled facade, uh, a door they were not allowed to use, interestingly enough. They wanted the story of Bayview to be told so that those wrongs would not be repeated. They talked about the pain of walking down these hallways, women in cells on either side. You saw the room with one bed. It had triple high bunk beds in every room. So on the top bunk, you couldn't even sit up. Um, but they also wanted to tell the story of the YMCA. And these, these are the mosaics from the swimming pool, which of course, when they were inmates, they never saw. Um, so they wanted to tell all those stories. And so we thought, okay, how do you design a building like this? Uh, how do you tell all those different histories? Where do you even walk in? Uh, where do you gather? And what makes a building a place for a community? So we thought it should be linked together by common paths. Those are the green as you move up, spaces, shared resources. Um, and then came the question, okay, 
what does it look like? We were adding to it to get enough square footage because in this neighborhood, there is a lot of flash. Some of it's good. Um, so we decided that the addition uh, should not look like the old building, but also not be all glassy flashy like the rest of the neighborhood, but something in the middle and something responsive to the environment and to interior comfort of the occupants. Um, and we focused a lot on making outdoor spaces because that's very much in short supply in New York. Um, and I will tell you that it was very, very sad uh, that the project ended up not going forward primarily because of the enormous cost of construction in New York City. But we learned so much from this project. And most recently, I participated on a governor's panel in the state of New York for what they should do with the 12 New York State prisons that they're now decommissioning. So I think there is promise even in the experience uh, of the building not being built. But this one, however, did get built. This is another adaptive reuse project lowered on, in, located in the East Village, a former New York City public school, PS 122, now called the 122 Community Center, designed by a guy who designed 400 New York City public schools all over the city. Um, it was completed in 1894. You may have seen it because it was where they filmed the first fame. Um, some of you are too young to know. That, that was. And then in the 1980s, when the city closed the, bu uh, the building, architect, uh, sorry, architects, artists, designers, artist groups, theaters groups started squatting in the building. So this is Keith Aaron in his studio in 122. Then the city took the building back and essentially issued an RFP that said, we have to bring this thing up to code and heat it and cool it and meet handicap accessibility. Um, and we thought, aha, that's really actually, we can need all the code and do something great for this place. So we added this luminous kind of circulation core to the side of the building so you could enter from the street. We added that awning. Um, and we really kind of said, there's something new here. This is not an old school. The canopy almost like reaches out and says, come on in. Um, and the idea is that the addition is clad in perforated stainless steel. It shimmers in the daytime and light comes through it at night. Uh, and the real idea was that it not look anything like the 130 year old building that it uh, sits next to or abuts. And we did that kind of everywhere in the building. So you can see the old stair rail and then the new stair rail behind it where we had to replace it. So we never imitated the past. We always intentionally contrasted with the past. And this is what goes on in this building. This is actually a skateboard ballet troupe. Um, and they're practicing, but we, nothing was meant to be precious, nothing meant to be historic, just there and kind of available for use and invention as it had been for so long. Now we do adaptive reuse projects all over the country and we always ask what kind of good they can do. So one thing they could do is enrich a city set. So here in Louisville, Kentucky, we worked with a husband and wife who are passionate about their city and worried about its decaying downtown. They love Louisville. They were fanatic contemporary art collectors and they had a sort of natural sense of hospitality. So they decided to take five of these 19th century warehouses and turn them into a hotel that now looks like this. And there's a David, not the real one. Um, so they, this was the first of the 21C Museum Hotels. We subsequently did eight more of them, almost all of them in uh, adaptive reuse historic buildings. And part of their idea was that a hotel is open 24-7, 365. So why not be able to look at art 24-7, 365? Um, a place of hospitality where people who maybe wouldn't go to a museum would be willing to look at art in this hospitable context. Uh, so there are all kinds of programs of hospitality. This is the uh, restaurant. There's always a great bar in these places and public art throughout the lobbies. But the challenge in this building was how do you make hotel rooms? So we cut a big hole down the middle of the building, held it up with this big steel truss that again, we showed off as, okay, this is really new and it's holding up the remains of that party wall um, in order to create an internal courtyard that additional hotel rooms 
could look at. So here's another one. Uh, this one is in Oklahoma City. And it's this incredibly cool building, which is an Albert Kahn Ford factory facility. Um, and we totally made the building new and unexpected, a new use. Who puts a hotel inside an old car factory? But also brought life to a portion of the city where the streets had been empty and uh, there had been no activity whatsoever. So what was so interesting, I learned all this, that Model Ts were assembled in the, this building, but they were brought flat pack style by freight car then assembled and then distributed around the region. So Ford had buildings like this all over the center of the country. Um, and of course, it stopped being used a long time ago and had less and less and less in it. Um, it had a very heavy structure, as you might imagine, you could drive cars around inside of it. And it was very, it filled an entire city block. So once again, we decided to cut big holes in it. Uh, it was hard to cut holes in this because the floors were thick and had a lot of steel in them and put in air shafts that uh, would bring light into the hallways. And you can see these totally fabulous columns that the building had, as well as make these really, really interesting rooms that looked into uh, the light shafts. And as with a lot of our adaptive reuse work, when there's something to cherish in the building, like the columns, this one had like a million coats of paint and was a total state of ruin. So we made it the centerpiece of the bar, why not? Um, like you celebrate what you find and that makes the place authentic to that location and that location only. So up at Harvard, um, the, the law school was having a bunch of issues, including that it had this old library that sat in the middle of their portion of the campus and they wanted to make it more accessible, both literally and to send a message that they too were changing and encouraging more people to participate in what they do. So they hired us to transform this 1959 building, Shepley Bullfinch for those of you architect fans in the room. Uh, it was a law library stacks building. It was just filled with books and really low ceilings and it was totally dark inside. Um, into a student-facing, public-facing place. Um, uh, so we rewove that portion of the campus. You could cut through the building. We uh, added a floor uh, and we introduced, again, you see these same ideas over and over, new visibility so that you could tell what was going on and participate if you wanted. We also cut holes. Once again, I have very few tricks. I just get better and better at them each time. Um, but to bring in light and also make uh, places where people want to gather, uh, hangout spaces, I think people are really drawn to natural light. And the addition on the top and the new frontispiece, which is where we put faculty offices, uh, really changed the perception of what happened inside here. But it also gave us an opportunity to do a life cycle analysis. And we found through looking at this building, the you know, combination of some new construction, uh, but reusing an old building that we garnered a 40% reduction in embodied carbon emissions than what would have happened if they had torn it down and built a new building. So it saved overall about a million tons of embodied carbon emissions which is about the annual energy of 120,000 homes. So, you know, I said before you want to do good, but there are lots of ways to do good. And some of them are maybe not so visible, but they're still very present. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. I also think sometimes that adaptive reuse, which I believe in passionately, as you can tell, um, is to take a very, very light touch. This is an H.H. Richardson insane asylum in Buffalo, New York, that we turned into a hotel. I won't go into the details, but I just want to see how little we did relative to the, the enormous impact of this uh, 19th century building just to bring it to today's times. Now, sometimes buildings house art and sometimes they are places to make art. And this particular building in upstate New York was designed by Ian Pei. I like this picture of him so much I had to include it. Um, and 
he had this remarkably pure idea for this campus. You can see on the left-hand side, this like perfect circle, the grid of buildings next to it, the diagonal line. And on the right-hand side, you can see exactly what they did, which is right in the middle of that perfect circle. They put an enormous parking lot. Um, and as such, the building that we were asked to renovate and add to, everybody parked in the parking lot and then entered the building through the freight entrance. So, because uh, the front door was around the other side, it was way too icy to get there because it was in Buffalo, you know? So, um, or Fredonia, I should say, outside of Buffalo and even colder. Um, so this was the language of the building. And I have to tell you, there's a part of me that's actually a fan of this kind of architectural language, but it makes no sense in upstate New York, these enormous pieces of single pane glass, these absolutely smooth concrete surfaces that the ice just sheets right down. Um, so we added to the building uh, where, the, where you see the red because they weren't gonna get rid of the parking lot so we could give the building a proper front door and welcome people. Uh, it looks like this, they're actually protected from the snow. Um, and the idea was that we would respect Pay's palette of metal and concrete, but kind of invert it. And we would also show off the activities inside. It's an art school. So you can see that in these two approaches here, the concrete um, and, and the view of the windows. Um, but performance of the building in terms of sustainability mattered enormously for us in a way that it hadn't mattered for Pay at all. Um, and you can also see in this picture, the relationship between the old and the new, the old building is on the, on the left. So we have a lot more depth in our facade, uh, different approach to windows, a different approach to volume making, different approach to kind of rhythm. But inside uh, we made really working spaces, the kind of spaces that I really like, as you've heard me say before, they're not precious. Uh, and they're really spaces where the work is what's foregrounded, uh, not the architecture. And as in the other reused projects, we saved what mattered. So that long concrete wall on the very left is actually Pay's previous exterior wall, and now it makes a space inside the building. And then on the left-hand side of the image on the right, there was a door frame where students who had produced and been in plays for the 40 years that the building had been there had signed their names in magic marker on the door frame. And we thought, well, we can't lose that, right? That's an important piece of history. So, to, so you think a lot about what you saved in these old buildings. But then we added things like a big new dance studio um, that actually sends a light out to the rest of the campus, sort of a beacon saying that the arts are here, come join us. Now, I'm going to talk next very quickly uh, about a project that contributes to the revitalization of a neighborhood, the Dixwell neighborhood in New Haven, Connecticut, which is right next to Yale, but not remotely a part of Yale, that also has to do with the arts and adaptive reuse. Um, and the project was imagined by this man, uh, Titus Kafar, a painter. He received his MFA from Yale. We never met at Yale, but we met through the 21C hotel folks because they collected his work. And we discovered all the ways in which our lives overlapped. We had the same clients. We knew the same people who collected art. And we held certain strongly held shared beliefs. Um, this, his work examines the history of representation by transforming and manipulating what you might call historic paintings. Uh, and he cuts them and crumples them and shreds them and chars them uh, and reconfigures them into works that tell a different story of history than the original painting. And I think in some ways it's actually related to adaptive reuse. These are two more works, one done with the poet and scholar Dwayne Betts, where they blacked out parts of um, uh, legal cases to tell a different story or where you see this is actually George Washington and on the gold strips are all the names of his slaves. But that's not architecture, that's just a little bit of Titus's background. Titus found two abandoned buildings, uh, a former lab supply manufacturing facility and an ice cream factory further down the block, the other brick building, and asked us if we would help him turn them into an artist residency program that reused the structures. And both were in barren states of complete disrepair. And so this is what it looks like now. They contain memory 
and they also contain the new, and they contain a lot of promise. Um, so it's a community center, a hub, and an arts center. And every year, it's now its fourth year, <clears throat> 12 resident artists, two resident curators, and a group of students from the high school down the block who are paid interns uh, work here, make work here. Um, there are community events, gallery openings, during COVID, they did vaccines here and testing here. They give out food uh, at holidays. And, the, and rich collectors come up from New York and buy work. So we demolished the bits that were not worth saving and we renovated the parts uh, that one could celebrate and we added what was missing. So we made spaces that were visible. There aren't pull down gates, there's big glass windows come on in. Um, and they talked about the layers of what was there. Again, not precious. So this is the gallery space. It has all the air quality control of a, of a museum somewhere so that they can have important work there. Um, but Next Haven also has the paid apprenticeship program I talked about. These are some of the high school students and they too get to show their work in the gallery and you know have their grandparents come and be part of a celebratory event like artists for everybody, whether you whatever you make it out of. Um, and the residents learn not only they have they have the support to have a year of making their work, but they also learn about the legal aspects, the financial aspects, what a gallery owes you, so that they are not exploited as artists. And I think in a lot of ways, adapted buildings have an uncanny way of allowing artists to thrive. I, so we were inspired by all the brick patterning that we discovered in the building uh, in the process of demolition. And so we decided to play the addition, which has both studios and three little apartments in it in a basket weave pattern of very inexpensive bricks so that it would look distinct, but also uh, part of the whole um, again, this idea of contrast and tying together at the same time. And I have to say, I like texture and pattern, and I think you should find it, whenever you find it, you should uh, celebrate it, um, at, just as this building has now gone on to really celebrate and become a magnet in this, you know, really profoundly challenged neighborhood. So here I am arguing for adaptive reuse and the revitalization of cities. But shrinking cities are the phenomenon of shrinking cities all over this, particularly the central part of the United States, are not caused by a lack of imagination. I think it's uh, it's a phenomenon of urban decline, really complex causes, right, that architects can't solve. The industrialization, loss of jobs, population decline, the impact of automobiles, uh, mass market shopping, Amazon, Walmart, uh, pulling businesses out of the cities, a lot of issues. But the other issue we have about cities that is really important to talk about is sprawl, the ever expanding urbanization of land. There's a great professor I've become friends with at Yale. Uh, she's an urban scientist from the School of the Environment, Karen Sito. She says that 20,000 American football fields are converted. That piece of land, you can all visualize a football field, 20,000 of them are converted daily to urban areas around the globe. That is a terrifying amount of land. So this, just to bring that point home, is Las Vegas, 1976. And this is Las Vegas, 2015. It's not a good story. The environmental costs of urban expansion have been tremendous. Habitat fragmentation, loss of biodiversity, modification of regional climate, which you could certainly experience when you go to Phoenix. Uh, and the removal of carbon sequestering forests. Um, you can also see that it's impacted the size and edge of Lake Mead. So I showed you this picture before the analysis we did of the building at Harvard. So we, this was during COVID, we got a little bit of that federal money. We didn't have anything to do, all the projects had totally stopped. Uh, so we decided to do some creative, imaginative thinking. And we took that embedded carbon number that we had learned from the Harvard Adaptive Reuse Project, and we decided to extrapolate it at an urban scale. We're in New York, so we use New York. Um, 
And we found the number of new construction projects that occur annually in Manhattan. And we thought, what if, we're not gonna be greedy, what if half of those projects were adaptive reuse? Not all old buildings can be reused. Some are toxic, some are in really bad shape, some are not the right form for the new use. So half of Manhattan new construction projects were used. Over a hundred years, we would reduce carbon by 7.9 billion kilograms of CO2. So we looked into what that actually meant because it also meant eliminating construction waste and demolition waste. So we would also save about 52 million tons of construction waste over that same time period. So we looked at those two things, they're total fictions, right? Um, getting to 50% reuse in Manhattan and you get about 925 million homes annual energy emissions, 1.67 billion passenger vehicles worth of annual emissions, as well as the weight of 138 Empire State Buildings, or out here, 18 million Ford F-150 trucks um, in less wasted materials. That's something you can kind of sort of wrap your head around. It's a lot. So it's real money, it's real carbon. Um, and these are not new challenges. They're really, really difficult ones to overcome but we have to. I mean, we really, really, really have to. We as architects and designers, we are among the, the many contributing authors of the built environment, which contributes so much to the problems we have. So hence my passion for adaptive rules. Um, this is us in my office. Um, Chris asked for a little bit of an autobiography. You got one, I apologize if it went on for a little bit. But it wasn't just mine, it was also ours. We're a lot of different voices. We make room for a lot of voices, but together we are passionately working on this issue. But we also practice in a way that I would call expanded. So we show the work of underrecognized artists. That's Kiki Smith. She's not underrecognized, but she came to see the show uh, of an uh, underrecognized artist at our office um, and give them the celebration they deserve. We participate in educational opportunities to introduce children and young adults to issues of design. Um, we do marches for causes we believe in. And we actually use our access to well-known famous friends to further argue for the importance of, for everyone of good design. You know, I could give a lecture where, anywhere, right? Where it just showed, showed lots of handsome photographs of our work. You know, we do high end retail, we do cold domestic stuff, we do modern additions on historic buildings. I like a lot of color, as you saw in some of the projects. We like places where people make things and do work with their hands. And I really enjoy the simple pleasure of architectural composition and the textures that come out of using different materials. I think buildings should have a purpose and I think they should build community and cultivation and contemplation and conversation. And then I ran out of C words, but I think they should also encourage people to read. This is a little library in the town of Hope, Indiana. Because I think whether it's in a studio, a hotel, a dorm, a house, a school, whatever it is that you're designing as an architect, um, I think it's our job to embrace life and in the process, make life better for everyone. So thank you very much. To be happy to answer questions. Who has questions? Or not, if you don't have any. Oh. Um, so, is it harder to build a new building that's sustainable or to retrofit an one to be sustainable? There's no simple answer to that question. It depends a lot on the existing building you're using. And you know, can you put in new windows and how can you further insulate the walls and how can you fit contemporary, uh, more efficient systems into the building, into the old building? 
But depending on how you decide to measure these things, and we're all working on ways of figuring out how to measure them, what you save in not tearing it down, because there's so much in, in, in embedded energy in an existing building, including the human labor, right? As well as all the materials and the shipping of the materials to get to them to that site, you're already kind of ahead of the game. When you build, I guess I want to be really cautious here. When you build from scratch, step one, don't build on a greenfield site, right? You know, leave what's open and untouched, open and untouched. But if you build, say, on a parking lot in a city where there are already systems and you build an incredibly tight box using everything that's available in contemporary technology and being willing to spend the money on doing it right, you can make a very, very, very efficient building. But you still have to weigh, I think, if you're really being honest with yourself, the footprint of getting all the materials there, making all the materials, what the materials are made out of, where they came from, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, LEED doesn't really do it justice, the calculations, and I'm no expert in them, we're just around the edges of them, uh, are really, really complex. Um, in any of your recent projects, have you ever had the opportunity to repurpose materials in a new project? I would think that's something that when you're involved in adaptive use, you may have access to older materials and demo. So has that been an opportunity? Have you worked on anything? It, we've done that in a couple of different ways, and we've also been doing that in some of the programs that we do at Yale. So in my own work, sometimes it's honestly in some of the high-end residential that there are places, given where I live, they're up in Vermont and New Hampshire that take apart these are the buildings and we have used old barn doors, old hardware, old stone from counters. We've used, you know, things that were uh, granite bathroom dividers in old New York City men's clubs, turned them sideways and cut them and turned them into counters, right? So if you're taking a building down, you want to take out it, much of it that's usable, that's really expensive. So the labor costs of that are really high. But we try to do it where, wherever we can. Um, at Yale, we have a number of programs where the students actually build buildings, and um, they were they are in the process of renovating the Natural History Museum, and the students were building an outdoor facility for teaching uh, in in some on some land that Yale owns, and so they took parts of the museum and repurposed them to make this outdoor classroom. So. And how could we do it? Well, the labor was free. You know, they were being paid student wages. So it's a really, really great idea. And the single biggest difficulty, other than hazardous materials, and you know, can you take old floorboards or beams and turn them into flooring without the nail blowing off or ruining the blade? Uh, but it, it really comes down to cost. So it's absolutely the right idea. Anybody else? about what person think is doing the impact of the environment. Um, I have a question about the word and the, and the, you know, the actual idea of a building. And you, you mentioned your, your students at Yale who are actually building. Um, and I, I do hear an architect often say the development project. But I don't think of architects as building the projects. I think of them as designing and writing and looking at the project for the most for the most part. I mean, mm -hmm. just for the and so I'm curious about your office and your relationship to actual building and, and also in terms of your work in education and teaching. Um, does it happen mostly on paper or is it with the physical sort of material? That's a really good question. It too is a really complex one. So Yale has this very long tradition. There's a alum sitting here in the audience who uh, knows about this tradition as well. It's something called the building project where the students design the building eventually together and then build it. And since I've been dean, it's been in public service. So it's been housing for the homeless population of, of New Haven. Um, but the truth of the matter is we still bring in an electrician, we still bring in a plumber, and it's a very simple wood frame building. And 
other than connecting to the community, doing good in the community, the real value, I think pedagogically, is not that you know which end of the hammer to use, but that you know how complicated it is, it is to put together all these different materials that come from all these different sources and make something that works, that looks good, that is watertight, that you can heat and cool, that you can sit in and enjoy with another person. So that's really what you're learning. I think when you look at any of the big buildings we've done, you wouldn't want us building them, you know, truly. They fall down, right? We don't know enough. I think it's just understanding, learning to understand and appreciate and value the expertise of others. There's no hierarchy to expertise, right? The plumber's knowledge is as valuable as the architect's knowledge. Well, I wonder if you're looking at sort of bigger ideas, sustainability, knowledge of materials and where they're coming from and then extracting processes and shipping and all of that um, versus being a great something with the material that closes to you. Well, I think that's really another good point. And if we need, we're really doing what it would do. It would allow us to pretty quickly analyze the, the footprint, footprint of the transit of the materials as well as you know, the extraction costs of the materials. Um, so when you look, when we look at all the vernacular buildings that we're drawn to, whether they're in New England or whether they're Adobe buildings here, I think part of the intuitive appeal, maybe something we can't even really put a word to, is that they feel of the place. And part of the reason they feel of the place is because we're used to them. But I think the more like, subtle on the spiritual reason I feel of the place is because they were made out of that place. Thank you. Huh? Um, I think you after I uh, asked um what advice coming from you as a professor of your career overall would you give to even I'm an undergraduate, so I'm not even thinking about past graduate school. Yeah, I'm more thinking about going into graduate school. But I feel very lucky being here in New Mexico. Um, I'm not native to the state, but there is a huge emphasis, I think, that's been put through the university in the last couple of years with acknowledging past and some of the things that she's saying about, you know, acknowledging where materials come from, acknowledging the land that we are on, acknowledging the history of that land and the change of you know, from indigenous occupation and, and ownership to this overlay of, you know, colonization. Um, and so I I just wonder as going off into the world of architecture and wanting to make a better place, how do you feel undergraduates especially and graduate students should be looking at a career within architecture? Because especially for me going to like fur crawls, there's a lot of emphasis on Revit and just like making a building. Oh, they just want to know what schools you have, right? There's not really, there, there's, there's talk of, of community, but not emphasis of community. And I feel that that's a, a big part of the architectural world still so on a working level versus a design or a university level. Well, you can help change that, I guess, <laughs> would be um, one, I would look, and, and your parents would probably shudder if they heard me say this, but go look for a firm where they and how they practice embodies values that you share. Now, they still have to earn money, right? They have to pay their rent, they have to pay their employees, they have to pay for health insurance, they have to do all that stuff. So uh, the architects are not going to change the capitalist system of the United States or the globe, right? We're not. Um, but you can find a place that values good design and is honest about what work they'll take on and what work they won't take on and what value proposition they expect a client to have when they build a building. And then it's okay if part of what you're doing is rather honestly, you gotta get the building built, right? Gotta produce the drawings. And you, as somebody who's just coming out, has to actually learn how to do all that stuff so that the building doesn't fall down and that the ruins are well proportioned and that they serve their purposes, right? So doing that stuff is not terrible. You just have to share the purpose for what it's being done. You can also hear the 
<laughs> Anybody else? All righty then. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.